eruption. It erupted on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve. So that top that you see there, that was gone then. And this, I think, gorgeous shape, this really nice shape of the curve and kind of counter curve and all that. But Mount Etna, you look at that and say, what is it? I think that's lovely. It is lovely. It's it's sort of, there's something very bird-like about it. I don't know why. <laughs> there's some... Birds are on my brain in a big way. There, there's some connection with the, the, yeah, the seem, avian population. Yeah, they into things. The birds seem to come in to things. That map that I asked Douglas to get, I marked all the places where I came to. Oh, right. I couldn't mark them except with green because so oh, they're all little places around the around Mount Etna and they're the places that I have gone so far to paint and that train run that I showed you a lot of them are on that so it's the train is called the Cherkometnia it it goes from one village to another and you, it's a, it's great really if you're interested in the mountain because it shows you how people are living and how they're working. All these villages have a, something special, you know. One has music, one has wine, one has. They all have something, and they they work in the shadow of this volcano. In some of the places you see, <clears throat> you know, half a wall, outhouses gone, and then they rebuild, they rebuild with the cool lava, make blocks of the cool lava with this little machine that's there, and build up the wall again till the next time. But if it's a very severe eruption like the one on Christmas Eve was, uh, that's more serious, you know, do more damage. The benefit would be that the richness of the earth after the thing settles down the, the soil is so rich, and that gets washed down the base. There's this valley, the Alcantara Valley, and huge crops like oranges the size of grapefruit and marvellous crops grow there, and that's, I suppose, positive aspect of it. Positive, yeah. But I saw a man there uh, on, on his land taking the cool lava, lumps of cool down and then putting them aside, making a little place to put down the, the vine, the, the vines. And and um, I remembered that I saw a man down in Connemara doing the same thing, taking the stones out of the field and put, making a wall and putting in potato drills. Yeah. Same thing. S same thing. So I use a rough canvas. So if I take, say, a, a dark colour to mark in and then change my mind, uh, it's a bit of a job to get the marking up. Yeah. And what's the name of the brush you're using? It's very unusual. This brush is, oh, it's bristle. It's, um, it doesn't say, it's just French. The French put everything in French and then they have the cheek to export it. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I put out the medium, the Turks, and a little bit of oil to start with. Not too much oil because you should work. That's the Turks. You, you meant to work from lean to fat. In other words, if I'm working now with that Turks and oil, <clears throat> tomorrow I must add more oil so that from the drying point of view, and uh, otherwise you run into trouble with cracking and that kind of thing. I use a knife a lot. I use a box. I use a pallet as well, but the box is fine because you can put the lid on it and come back to it. Great idea, I've never thought of that. Yeah, I didn't have a canvas ready. I'm going to reduce the size of that. I 
because otherwise you can lose the tension. The scale has got to be correct for it. There is a bird shape there. You can't paint what you saw, just what you see either, that doesn't work. You have to arrange the shapes, so that's the difficult bit. That's always the difficult bit. All I'm doing now is trying to make, if I have a very definite line and it's dark, just try to remember it. You might want to take it out you know, as you go along. So you need to. White is the best co covering power, as you know. But better not to have to. I don't want to put on any more paint on that in case I have to take a lot of that out. You have to think about it now, do you, before it goes any further, yeah. Yeah, I have to go away and then come back and think, oh, why did I think that was right? You know, I've often gone up after painting maybe all day, if I was painting here and then come down in the morning and look, <laughs> why did I think that worked? No. Touring and throwing, that's why it's a slow business showing those big paintings is particularly slow. Then sometimes it'll all just happen and, uh, and it'll come right for you. Oh, I used to do the veil skull in Dingle and the, they were nearly all teachers that came on the course. Some of them were very, very good. Like everything was former, small-ish, which by virtue of the way we live and where we live and all the rest of it, you're stuck with that because but you can't paint one of those in the corner of your kitchen, you just can't do it. You need too much paint and it's too much uh, and you can't, st you have to be able to stand back and it needs room. And they all wanted to try a large canvas, but they were afraid. They were intimidated because the big canvas probably just cost a fortune but you can scrape it on, you know. But that concept doesn't come into somebody's, a lot of people, it doesn't come into their psyche. Just scrape it down. There's no harm done. Nobody died. <laughs> and I think looking at volcanoes makes you think differently too because you see all this stuff happening and, and, and the, the power of it and nothing can stop it. And, and uh, you think, well, why am I fussing about little things? You know, when you see that, nothing, nothing. That's why I think I like painting is that 
the mystery of it indeed.